I love sports business and media. And on Suiting Up Podcast, we talk with other athletes, media executives, team owners, and other key stakeholders about the duality of the modern player, the influence of startup investing, strategic investments, new co's, social media influencing, creative marketing, and digital strategy. Today's athlete, whether active or retired, is continuously redefining what it means to be a professional on and off the field. Welcome to episode 12, and I'm your host, Paul Rabel. And my guest today, for the past 20 plus years, writes about the intersection of sports and business for Bloomberg Media. They're the largest global business media company, powered by 2,700 plus journalists and analysts across 120 countries. In addition to his lead role with Bloomberg Sports Business, he's been featured on Yahoo, Chicago Tribune, Huffington Post, the Boston Globe, the Globe and Mail, Seattle Times, and 114 other major market publications. And that's according to his muckrack profile. He calls himself a sports onlooker, and I say that's very humble. He's broken more news and major sports headlines than most of his peers, likely combined. And I've been fortunate enough to snag a few occasional coffees and meals over the last number of years to glean as much as I can, both in current news and predictive insights. Scott Soshnick, welcome to the show, buddy, sits down with us today. Our topics range from the NFL, NBA, to pro lacrosse, esports, Cable television versus live streaming, how to secure a major sponsor, and which league commissioner is doing it best. Enjoy, everyone. Currently, I'm rocking a beard, and my YouTube audience even uses hashtag fear the beard when describing me. And although I'll tell you, I did not anticipate beard care. Things like trimming, taking a sharp blade around the edges for form... So yes, even guys with beards have to shave. The biggest thing to happen to Barbasol since shaving cream is also the only thing to happen to Barbasol since shaving cream. Introducing new Barbasol razors. The brand America trusts for a close, comfortable shave now has premium disposable razors. Barbasol's close shave technology on every razor means you get an advanced pivoting head and ultra-thin open flow blades. The Ultra 6 Plus Razor also features a seventh blade, specifically designed to refine and style tricky areas like under the nose, sideburns, and yes, my beard. Visit Barbasol.com and get a $2 savings coupon and see for yourself why Barbasol razors are the number one new disposable razor out there. You're looking good, America. You're shaving with Barbasol. My man. On the Upper East Side, we met, what, five years ago? Five years ago? Yeah, what was that article? Somebody, I know, I don't want to be mean, I'm not going to say which outlet, but (laughs) somebody wrote an article that was, how should I put this, very familiar to me. People people were emailing me saying, didn't you write this? (laughs) Right. Is there, are, are there... Is there existing dialogue from a legal standpoint that goes back and forth when... If I wanted to push it, I mean, if they had taken anything, this was more of the premise. Right. But there are occasions where things will pop up where I'll alert our PR folks, and if they feel it rises to some sort of necessity Mm -hmm. to get our legal involved, they'll do so. But uh, it just seemed like... Right. (laughs) It was very familiar to me, (laughs) and, and other people noticed it as well. So... We met about five years ago, roughly, at a burger joint in Philly. Bruges. Bruges. Yeah. It was, a, it was the my, best burger oh, my had. favorite. I told you. When you all come, I said, I'll come to Philly, right. and we'll have lunch at Rouge. And, and that's where we crafted, you crafted the article that we're talking about, the original one, one of the ones that catapulted me in not only uh, cross-sport and mainstream sport recognition through the vehicle of Bloomberg and... Um, and, and your sports business editorials. We were also featured on Bloomberg TV, but continued to uh, spark my interest in, in greater sports business. But we sat down that day and uh, both had notepads, and it was less of an interview. It was more of a conversation. More of a conversation. Two things stuck out to me when you sat down. It's weird. Sometimes this happens for writers. Like the lead hit me immediately because people had told me I wasn't so familiar with your career, but everybody was saying, oh, he's the face of lacrosse. And then you sat down and you had the Red Bull hat tugged down, which, by the way, wasn't even that cold. So like you could have been in Brooklyn. <laughs> but I was like, the face of lacrosse has his face covered by 
You know, it just hit me. Like, I knew as soon as you sat down that that was going to be the lead, that huh. the face and the brand, so that was easy. And then you were the only athlete I've ever interviewed who was taking notes. Right. That, those are the two things that stuck out. And the burger was good. Burger was good. Yeah, I think about the conversation that we had there that turned into the article that we're referencing. I'm going to get this right. It was titled, Johns Hopkins Lacrosse Millionaire Hits Wall Street to Find Fame. There are certain buzzwords <laughs> in the Bloomberg <laughs> Terminal <laughs> that will guarantee lots of readers. The only two things that I would say I left out that are in sort of the pantheon are Goldman Sachs mm-hmm. and Tiger Woods. Mm. Like Tiger in the day... Let's just say we had issues, people forcing Tiger Woods yeah. <laughs> into headlines that really right. didn't have a whole lot to do with right. Tiger, right? because then people would read it. Yeah. So the, the clickbait was there, but lacrosse, millionaire, Hopkins, Mike Bloomberg, alma mater, didn't hurt, you know, right. you get the boss happy. Exactly. But listen, as soon as you write lax, there's a huge, huge lacrosse fan base on Wall Street. There is. I wrote a story also about the recruiting that goes on for coaches. Mm-hmm. Um, which coach was it? Uh, Virginia. Dom Starja. Yeah, I, I spoke to him. And that was one a good of, article. And, and he said, yeah, the lead, well, as soon as he said, it's great. I love when the lead hits me right away. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I sit with a, with a recruit and I take out a big book of business cards and I put it down in front of him. I say, thumb through this and where do you want to work? Yeah. You want to work at Goldman? You want to work at J.P. Morgan? Uh, yeah, this is, all, this is our alumni network. That story that you unpacked has now become famous amongst Division I coaches in college lacrosse because they often flaunt the network in powerful industries to their, to their team and the players and say, hey, we can connect you. And they can connect them, but there hasn't been much like tangible – kind of take-home packet of then report back, here are all the industries that are alumni and here are their, their levels of hierarchy. Tell me who you want to reach out to and make that commitment. And it sounded like this almanac of business cards that Virginia had. Now I'm seeing other teams do it. Yeah, I remember, I'm still on the network, the VLAN, Virginia yeah. Lacrosse Alumni Network. I never yeah. got off. I signed up when I was doing the story just <laughs> yeah. to see what was going on. Uh. And I still get these updates from the VLAN, and it's exactly what they say it is. Yeah. It's just this vast network of former players who are more than happy to help those who came after they did. We, you, you mentioned clickbait earlier, back to that title. Um, in your world, and, 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 and now it's become more of a ubiquitous phrase with influencer marketing and social media now more prevalent than it's ever been. Why is there a negative connotation associated with that? I, I mean, there's, there's content everywhere. And if it's relevant to the piece, which in this case it was, it, it feels more strategic. Yeah, I don't think this piece would fall under clickbait. This was actually one where people would see the, the buzzwords yeah. and think it might be clickbait. Yeah. But if you read the story, then you would realize, oh, well, this, this fits. You're right. right. Every part of this is addressed as a major part of the story. Yeah. If it was just utilized in some way where you were tangentially mentioned or lacrosse wasn't really a part of the story, maybe down low, you could understand it. That's where the negative rap comes from. Yeah, and you know what? I don't really get judged by clicks, so I'm confident enough. I've been doing this long enough. Yeah. My articles speak for themselves. Right. My job is to break news, the biggest sports business stories in the world, so I try and do that. Yeah, And when I write a feature, I'm not worried about, I need 20,000 people, 30,000. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. It's, it's, I write a story. I just want to write a good story. Sometimes it'll get more readers, sometimes less, whatever it is, it is. And, and you've been reporting for nearly 25 years and have been with Bloomberg for a long time and spearheading their sports business, you know, helping with the initiatives on, on Bloomberg TV, now recently launched the podcast, Business of Sports. Um, why and, and when and how did you decide that, like, hey, reporting and investigating is something that is not only important to me, but what I want to pursue in my career? Well, I interned at WFAN, the all sports radio station in New York. Yep. Everybody knows I miss Mike and the Mad Dog. Yep. So I was there uh, in high school. I was there in college during breaks. And then I started right after I graduated 
as sort of intern slash producer and overnight work. And literally, how pathetic is this? I mean, people can't see the studio, but yeah. a modern digital studio, <laughs> there's a reason they say cut tape. Yeah. I literally cut the tape yeah. <laughs> and spliced it together to play interviews. I mean, that's what we did. So that's how old I am. But six months in, I'm driving on the Grand Central one day, and I heard, I'm not going to, again, I don't want to say exactly who it was, but, and one of the annoying jingles for a show host right. hit me like a ton of bricks, man. I was like, I don't want to do this. I thought I did. Yeah. But the thought of just talking about athletes' hamstrings and the, just the sports radio chatter. Stats. Yeah, I didn't care. It hit, I, I was the kid who grew up. I thought I had the best job in the world. This is the greatest. I'm all set. Six months later, I don't want to do this. And I cold called Bloomberg because they had a billboard on the Grand Central Parkway. They put me through to the one guy in the sports department who said, you know, I was thinking about hiring somebody. A week later, I started. Cold calling. Cold call. Love that. Just said, hey, I'm curious. What do you got? And he said, boy, you can save me some trouble. So I went down. And we both laugh at it now. I had 23, two, whatever I was, this really ugly, like Rick Pitino red blazer. <laughs> well, I mean, who wears that on an interview, right? Oh, it worked. Uh, I'm uh, going uh, to start. Well, uh, <laughs> and it almost, like, that almost was enough for him to be like, no, 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 this is not going to work out. Right. But luckily, luckily it did. And, and now with Bloomberg access, you, you mentioned, you know, you don't pay attention to clicks and readership, but 50 million readers plus 200 million viewers worldwide, the network is, is huge. Um, being a part of the growth and leading the sports business group specifically, what has been some of your favorite moments? And, and we could qualify that as articles or events that you've been to. My, my, my flat brim sticking out over my head, you know, really low on that list. But I, I take from that story that there are probably moments of greater magnitude with other athletes. And well, it's not just athletes. It, it's been the whole thing of when I started, not only sports business was sort of in its nascent stages of mattering to people, but Bloomberg itself. So I'd get people, I would call teams or executives like, Bloomsburg, what? Mm. <laughs> so you explain yeah. well, what I'm calling from. And, and then I sort of hit a space where I was working with a lot of owners. So whether it be team PR guys or some executives, the one that stood out the most, where I knew things had changed, I called the Miami Heat for something. And let's just say they weren't the quickest to respond. Maybe I wasn't the Miami Herald in their mind, hmm. so it wasn't the number one to-do call back, right? Right. So I shot a note to Mickey Arison, yeah. the CEO of Carnival Cruise Lines, who owned the Heat. Within a minute, the phone rang, what do you need? Yeah. So somebody got the message that this outlet matters to me. The billionaire owner, the CEO of the publicly traded company, take care of this guy. This matters. And it's only grown since then, especially with the rise of who the folks are as the valuations have soared for these teams. It's not just the guy with a few bucks who can buy the team anymore. These right. are not just mom and pop organizations that they were when the guy bought in for 10 million, whatever right. it might be. 50, 90 million dollars. Yeah, now, now that Rocket gets you Donald what, a couple of shares? Right. right. Now we're multi billion dollar assets, and everybody, I can't remember the last owner who bought a team just to own a team. And that used to happen. That was guys buy a team because they thought it was cool, they wanted to be, and that was it. Yeah. Now the team is a tentpole for something. It's a media play. Yep. It's a real estate play. Exactly. It's something. It's yeah. not just, I want to own brand X. There's so much more to it. Over these 25 years of you having a, a, a really keen eye and touch on sports business, are we in a, in a time right now, as you mentioned, with these multifaceted, sophisticated sports ownership groups and everything that's going on from over-the-top networks to you know, the, the mega giants like Apple, um, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, getting into sports rights. Is this the 
this is the most dynamic time in sports business you've ever been a part of, or is it just a phase and not necessarily a phase? Is is it an is it a byproduct of technology? I I think you hit it there. It's the technology. Everything is content. Yeah. Everything is scalable. Now, it takes me two seconds to reach Asia. Mm-hmm. It takes me two seconds to reach Europe. Everybody is a customer with everything that I do. So, I mean, David Stern on my podcast called the Amazons, the Googles, the sleeping giants who have yet to fully realize the value. And that's scary of this if, 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 if we think they're sleeping giants they're, now. They, right, they've got the cash. So, all of this worry and this story has dominated this year. ESPN is losing subscribers. Uh oh, right. our valuation's going to plummet when this TV deal's up. Who's going to pay for these rights? If anything, they're becoming more valuable as a vehicle to reach the certain segment that advertisers love, as the technology allows for targeted ads. You and I could be sitting here. This is where we're headed. You and I and your producer, we're going to be sitting watching the same game on our phones or on our on our tablets or whatever, maybe the TV. If know, we may- push it from yeah, our phone yeah, or maybe, tablet. Yeah, if we push it up there, right. <laughs> if we mirror it to the TV, but your ad based on your data analytics and your Google searches and whether or not they link with perhaps your payment applications, totally going to differ from mine. Mm. You know, I have a little maniac, eight years old. Right now, if I search for sandals, the summer sandals, it stays in everything I do. My Facebook, every feed of mine, I get a sandals ad. Right. But soon it will be integrated yeah. where they'll know, oh, he bought the sandals. We can stop this. But he lives here. And data shows that this guy or eight-year-olds in this zip code have purchased this more than anything else in this time frame. And they'll, they'll target an ad to me. So while the audience may shrink in its totality, and they say people are abandoning, that that may happen. Mm. But the ability to target what I might want, I'm guessing that it's going to become even more valuable to advertisers and more successful and have better penetration for what they're trying to get me to buy. Advertising machine learning on top of it is far more sophisticated. It's new and it's getting better. Uh, I saw projections out that $18 billion are going to be spent in the next year on digital mobile ads, and that's up 43%. So it's actually growing faster than some of the more aggressive analysts predicted. Uh, and I think that's right. It's, it's more valuable, arguably, to a brand to be in front of a highly discerning customer, even if there are fewer of them, than to just like cast an ad out to, at best, 100 million people oh, watching a let's Super do it. Bowl I was game. Gonna, I was going to make the NFL angry and say the 110 million people yeah, watching yeah. the Super Bowl. That's ex- <laughs> you, you hit it right on the head. That's exactly it. What, what is Anheuser-Busch going to do? Would they rather have a hard targeted 30 million that they know drink their beer or and like beer? And by the way, can click right through. And can click through to the purchase? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the world we're headed the the other world that that is existing simultaneously are now folks like myself which in its oddity you know is is interviewing you i like you and oddity (laughs) in the same sentence by the way perfect yes but there is content being produced everywhere and um i've always found your positioning around social media i've 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 pushed you from time to time to be like scott you should have at least half a million people following your Twitter account right now. It's, it's like your your breaking news, your insights, your experience in the space, and you've always been like, it's not of interest to me. Like I, I, I'm I am reporting uh, on more massive platforms and obviously bandwidth less, but there are the inverse uh, strategies being taken on by uh, maybe younger reporters that are building social platforms and trying to get news out there. And then it's created a little bit of a nebulous environment when it comes to breaking news. Yes. And talk about that. Because well, breaking news is super important. Yes. Yeah, but it gets stolen all the time with social. Especially it's of added value at an outlet like Bloomberg. We have certain 
differentiating kinds of scoops. I mean, I can have somebody like somebody selling a sports team. That's fine. Or somebody's putting a market or, or buying a team. That's great. But when I broke the story last year that Twitter was getting the NFL rights, mm-hmm. the stock bounced 5%. Mm. There's your real value add to my employer, the customers who pay a lot of money to get Bloomberg's. That justifies why they have the machine. Think about what institutional investors can do with a 30-second, 60-second head start on news that moves markets. And we you're were talking f- about the subscription model. Yeah, and they, they pay – I mean, it's pretty – it's out there. It's like $23,000 a year for a Bloomberg terminal. And uh, some, I understand, have approached Mike and tried to negotiate price. And he said, no, we're the – premier product, and you're going to pay a premier price. And that feels cheap for first mover's advantage, Yeah, which is effectively what they got on that, that breaking news That's story. exactly right. Uh, and that's the holy grail for us. That's what we try and do. But it comes in various ways. Uh, I'll say our people came to us not long ago, and there was a Twitter feed that was purported to be Steve Ballmer. Mm-hmm. But he had a feed. This was a different feed. And it said that, hey, I've acquired 4% stake in Twitter. So a Sort of an email went out to the newsroom. Can anybody verify this? Now, I had dealt with Steve and his people when he was in pursuit of the Clippers, as well as the other bidders in the groups. I mean, that's sort of my job to be in that that barbarians at the gate centerpiece. Let everybody come to me when it's all happening. That's when you know things are going well and you're giving information, you're getting information. And I emailed Steve and he in 10 seconds said, yeah, that's me. And I relayed that to our headline desk. They flashed headlines and Twitter bounced again because Steve Ballmer was buying Twitter. And perhaps our technology reporters don't have the access to Ballmer or Cuban or Jim Dolan, take your pick. But because I deal with them pretty regularly on a passion project, I don't often talk to Steve about his technology business. It'll Mm -hmm. be basketball. But maybe he's more apt to pick up the phone or the email because it's me. Right. And in that case, it was a win for us. And it's because I had that relationship with him based on the sale of the team and and the contact we'd had over the time. In your seat, as you're approaching, you know, you said the inbound and the outbound and the investigative work – how much time are you dedicating or how much are you allotting to like, okay, I have a story that I'm creating, I'm incubating, use mine for an example. There's, there was no real time stamp on that. Ideally, you get it out when, when eyeballs are on the cross, which was during the Final Four and that May time frame. But I'm built, you know, you're building this original content and then there becomes timetable work that, that flows in, investigative work, breaking news stuff. So managing that's got to be pretty difficult for you. Yeah, for anybody. I I don't want to make it seem my schedule is more different than anybody else, but stuff stuff can fly at you fast. What's like a typical quota for you on an annual basis? How many stories are you getting out? How much does it matter? No quota. My my job is to break news. I mean, I can do 10 in a week if that's what that week delivers. Hmm. Nobody's yelling at me. Nobody's looking over my shoulder. That's, that's what I love about where I am, and mm. not only in my career, but with the people I've worked with for so long. They know that I'm not out there lollygagging. I'm working. No, I didn't write something today or maybe even the last two or three days. But they have a pretty good idea that something's going to be coming. Yeah. Like they know I have a list of stories in my file that I'm working on right now. Yeah. Like if my phone buzzes right now, I have to at least look at it <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because it could be news on the Miami Marlins. Right. Like I'm following that right now. Right. You have the Brooklyn Nets for sale. Mm-hmm. You have the Rockets for sale. Yeah. What's going on with the Islanders? What's going on with Cantor Fitzgerald and their gaming? Yeah. There's a bunch of stories that are happening. And those don't happen. They don't break every day. But there are things that occur 
you're on watch. Yeah, and, and I mean, on let's say the Marlins, just because everybody has been following it. Okay, Jeb and Jeter split. You know, we broke that. Okay, well, Tom Glavin joined this group. We broke that. There, there's things that happen along the way, but obviously the big story is who gets the team. Yep. You know, people were, they took some pot shots when we, we wrote that Jeter had won the auction. Mm-hmm. He did. Yeah. It's not incongruous for him to have won the auction, although in what has become a silly process. Right. He didn't have the money. Yeah. Okay, now everybody sort of got to speed, but he said, I'll give you $1.3 billion. <laughs> He just didn't have it. Right. So then, and everything went back, and here yeah. we are again, waiting for somebody to step front and get enough money to win this bid. I think you and I were having a coffee talking about that a, a few months ago, and you it's, were saying, like, hey, I reported what's accurate. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Right. At the time, it was absolutely accurate. Yeah. Derek Jeter is uh, the, or the the modern athlete, is what we're calling it, one that is uh, obviously very successful on Field Hall of Fame career and is now very entrepreneurial and staying within the sports realm and sports business, although probably more traditional than non-traditional in that he, he started his career, although it was his post-playing career after he retired, I'm sure he was incubating it along the way. There are many athletes now that are uh, that they were dubbing like kind of this dual threat, where they're doing both simultaneous to their performance. Um, that I presume wasn't the case as much as it is now when you were first starting and you were working with primarily the owners. Now you're probably keeping an eye on. Uh, a lot of the active players use Andre Iguodala, for example, and his strong portfolio of investments, and some have exited, and, and now he, you, you guys are co-sponsoring a tech summit of his and Steph Curry's out west. So they're, just say it, they're far more active. Are you going to be there, by the way? I am. Oh, okay, good. All right, that's done? Yeah, it's good. done. I'm glad. I'm glad we made it happen. Yeah, thanks for making that happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be there. Scott. Right. I emailed him. I was like, hey, man, can I get to this event? And you connected me with Richard Smith at LinkedIn, who's now listening to the podcast. So shout out, Richard, and you guys make it happen. But I appreciate that. I take so, my usual commission of zero. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I hey, mean. If I get into a deal there, we'll go in it together. We'll go into it. I put a lot of you people... you can't talk about that. Because no, I mean, I, <laughs> I do, in my everyday, I put a lot of people together that do do deals. Yeah. It's, like, my Rolodex is after 25 years, oh, not only do I know who's doing what, because that's my job, but I kind of have a sense of who would work well together, who has similar backgrounds, who thinks, thinks alike. So I do that all the time. I'm always introducing people. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, okay. No, you know, it's fine for people to have tried. Yeah. So we try that. But you hit it on the head. It's it's always been for me, owners, bankers, lawyers. That was the bread and butter. Hmm. But more and more, it is athletes. And gone are the days. And I'm sure you've heard this. Athletes want to be rock stars, and rock stars want to be athletes. Like that was the thing. Yeah. Athletes don't want to be rock stars. They want to be rock stars in venture capital now. Yeah. They want to be business rock stars. There's been this recognition, and I don't know when it started or who started. I really don't. Maybe it was, maybe it's Michael buying a team. Mm -hmm. And it's not like Michael put in $2 billion, but he did, or Magic, that he's in the deals. And now we're peeling back like, oh, Joe Montana is a successful yeah. venture capitalist right. that no one really talked about. And Ronnie Lott. Steve Young. Steve Ronnie, Young. Oh, yeah. oh, Steve Young's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did a story where, remember, I don't know if you read it, but Steve Young caught a little flack for saying, like, I probably wouldn't even be doing the football analyst thing, but I do business in the suites that we get during the game. Yeah, and yeah. so it makes it worthwhile. Yeah. So, yeah, even the retired athletes. But that didn't just happen when he was done playing. Grant Hill is one of my favorite stories because Grant, when he was a player, would spend the off days on the road meeting with opposing team owners, Hmm. saying, what are you doing? How do I? Just to learn, just to listen and learn. So Grant Educated upbringing, right? Both of his parents... Our professors, is that right? Were you telling uh, me that? J- Janet is on the board at Carlisle Group. Oh, that's right. Uh, and Calvin, everybody knows, former running back with the Dallas Cowboys, went to Yale. Mm-hmm. 
So, my, and if you want if you want a good story with how does that happen, like just how does Grant happen, this is one of my favorites, a quick anecdote. When he was six years old, he kept breaking his toys. And his mother warned him, you can't do that. You have to treat your stuff with respect. You don't just get new stuff. So what did he do? He broke another truck or whatever yeah. it was. So Christmas comes. She gathered up all of his toys that he'd broken. She had them fixed, boxed up, wrapped up, and she gave him his existing toys for Christmas. <laughs> Six-year-old Grant learned right there the value of taking care of your stuff. Huh. So it's not an accident that yeah. this happens. Yeah. You know, it's not just, oh, yeah, you know, Grant went to Duke and he said... There, there was a lot behind it. Is there uh, educational layers to that that are creating a platform that are educating the players on now where to invest their exorbitant salaries? Meaning, there were so many stories growing up about you know guys investing in their buddies' t-shirt business, restaurants, bars, restaurants that turns over. Yeah. You hear a lot of real estate, hotels, a lot of real estate, yeah. stuff like that. And now we're looking more at tech and. It's trended, and so now, as you said, the athletes don't no longer want to be rock stars. They want to be uh, tech investors. Um, what I've seen, Paul, is a recognition that, and this wasn't always the case. Let's say a guy signed a, what, you tell me, what would you say would be a whopping contract? I mean, in the NBA now, you're uh, talking you 150 say, million? 200, I mean, what did Har- Harden do? 200 Two million something? over okay. five? Now, over four. James, <laughs> sure, certainly a huge extension brings the total. Right, yeah. okay. James Harden, we all agree, could go to the beach for the rest of his life mm-hmm. and do nothing. And that's fine. He could live off the interest. That, that's that's yeah. fine. But more and more, there's a recognition of the difference between rich wealthy and uber wealthy Mm -hmm. the kind of guy who or or a woman who can single-handedly write the check and buy a team these days a guy like bill gates Mm -hmm. steve balmer mike bloomberg who by the way doesn't even like sports Mm -hmm. uh that i work for a man who doesn't even like sports (laughs) but recognizes at least other people do there's a recognition of another tier, another level. And that's what guys like LeBron now are striving to reach. Hmm. No longer content with the $100 million shoe deal, whatever it is for Nike, and he's got the lifetime deal, the endorsement money, the playing money. Again, a guy who doesn't have to do anything but is creating media understands the value of ownership and equity in Blaze Pizza, Mm -hmm. understands how capital grows, Hmm. and understands that there's a whole nother level, that there's a reason the owner owns the team. Yeah. He looks at Dan Gilbert and has to recognize, I don't have anywhere near what that guy has. Well, I think what's really interesting too is is that there's this misconception that we, we mentioned Jeter earlier in that $1.3 billion check that he didn't have is that athletes are spent, are investing a lot of money in these startups where a lot of these min checks are 25K. Yeah. I, I've seen some deals where athletes come in at $10,000 and, and you know guys that are making $100 million over three or four years are doing that. So there is uh, the it still is uh, fairly risk adverse in the in the opportunity that's being presented to them on behalf of the startups because you mentioned media too, where this is a more attractive investor now because of social media and the platform that they have and one of your biggest operating costs on an annual basis, especially if you're in a product or service business, market. is to market. Yeah, and you I love get, Twitter has a Twitter has a program called that which they would charge for it's amplification. Yeah. They amplify. Well, that's what these influencers are. Like LeBr- a tweet from LeBron amplifies around the world. It's worth 100K or something. Uh, easy, yeah. if not more. Right. Because I know something about his followers. He is a one-man broadcast station. He doesn't need anybody to get the message out. It's true. I do think that there are things a Bloomberg can do or a journal or a Times. I don't think that 
there's no room for that. But the fact remains, if LeBron wants to get something out there, he outgoes the tweet, and within five minutes, and I may even be long on that, it's around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do. I still think even traditional television and traditional media, there is this huge element that I think was once forgotten a short couple of years ago as social media was growing at the rapid rate that it still is today. Now more than ever, I think the smart folks in brand, athletes, and, and businesses know the validation you get from a Bloomberg, from a game that's on ESPN, even if it's in fewer homes. And, and that's a big deal uh, that we've seen time and time again for mainstream sports that have been there. But when you look at lacrosse, for example, that now has moved away from the, the ESPN weekly game and the CBS Sports weekly game and more to an OTT, I think there's a, a large element of risk that they, we didn't see and maybe all other alternative sports didn't see and just jumping to the OTT space because, you know, hey, we can control our own content, we can get it out, we can cater to our market, et cetera. There is still the big validating moment of being on television. And so how long will television be relevant for sports rights? For a while. Yeah. The, the TV is not going anywhere. It's still the centerpiece of it all right now. I, I People would rather watch. I, mean, I just, basic, if I'm away from home, it's a great tool that I can catch the game now on my, I don't know, what is it, a six-inch phone, whatever it may be. Yeah. Can't tell or, if they're going small. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Or, or, my, or my phablet <laughs> or my tablet. I mean, that's fine. But there's still nothing like sitting on the couch and having my, I think I have 50. I think it's a 50-incher. Yeah. But that's a nice experience. Yeah. And that fuels, there's a reason why we're having the debate of at home versus in arena because the experience at home, high def, is so good. Like, I don't think that's so good because I'm at home watching on my phone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about the screen plays a role in that. So TV is still and will be through at least the current crop of TV deals. And most of the major properties are locked up till about 21, 22. Hmm. At that point, we're going to see for sure Amazon, Facebook, Google, they will be bidders on rights. But again, those are delivery streams too. And they'll be the highest bidders. And they, no might, doubt. they might be the highest bidders, each company a little different. But Netflix, right? Who knows what Reed Hastings is going to The genius of Netflix, I think, is the price point. Hmm. It's eight bucks, eight, nine yeah. bucks a month. I have it. Yep. If I don't use it, so what? It's eight, nine bucks a month. I right. keep it. Right. So whether they want you to get in. You 104 million other subscribers. Yeah, ex exactly. Like, just do the math. I mean, do the math for yep. ESPN. 100 plus down to 90 and seven bucks per. Yeah. But so, different. ESPN's, I guess, that they're now considering and in some cases are going direct to consumer. But that's where Reed Hastings and Netflix... And more recently, you're seeing HBO and, and what you have with Apple and Amazon can do. Um, walk me and us through just the distribution relationship between ESPN, third-party cable providers, and how they're moving around, right? Because YouTube has made a big push yeah. um, at a lower price point for their YouTube TV in major markets, they just announced another, I don't know, 10 cities aside from their five cities they launched in. Um, and, and that's now seemingly a viable option too. It's very crowded, but the variable is you need internet. You, well, I've always- And then the internet prices are going up if you don't bundle the TV. Every and, time I hear somebody, and I don't know why this hasn't changed yet, but whether it's Brian Roberts or it's Jim Dolan- can we stop calling it the cable industry? It seems like it's so 1850. It's, it, this is the broadband. It's wireless. I know yeah. that's like with the, with the telcos, but it's not cable industry anymore. Like maybe the cable was in your house, but that's going away. Right. It's not cable anymore. And everybody should have seen this coming because nobody, there are no more broadcasters. There are narrowcasters. Hmm. 
everybody's a narrow caster because I want what I want. And if I don't fancy something, I don't see the need to pay for it because technology now dictates that I don't have to. Why should I subsidize the uh, Nickelodeon? I'm not watching it ever. Mm -hmm. And ESPN and the other sports channels were always the ones you held up as the prime examples of. They were the most expensive. Each customer had to pay for the right to have that in what's called the bundle. Mm -hmm. Because that was the way you could subsidize that array of networks. Now... The multi-system operators, MSOs, cable companies, have decided that we can offer skinny bundles. We can offer a la carte, yep. almost. That's the way it's being delivered. That's, that's the tension between the networks and the MSOs. And then you get the genius of, remember that the debate was always, well, what's more important? The content? Mm -hmm. Or the distribution. Right. It was always or. Now, there are ands. Yeah. You have the content creators who are also distributors. Yeah. That's the winner. Right. But who's now, who's got the best content? And how, at what price? That's what we have to see. So back to lacrosse. We're, we're looking for a new commissioner right now, actually. Are you interested? No. Okay. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. I feel like Shark Tank. You know what? I, I want to. Let me, let me try this. Let me try my best Mark Cuban. It, I, I never played the game. I, I don't have enough interest in it. And because of that, I am out. I'm out. <laughs> okay. Let's try this as a different exercise then. Let's, let's imagine that there was no pro lacrosse league, but we're in 2017 and you are consulting on the league and its strategy to populate and generate revenue. Um, it sounds like item number one is let's figure out distribution. L let me also add, you have the capital and you have the top talent committed to play for you. Are you looking at distribution, anchoring a deal in first before you roll out? And, and the product's good. You have the product figured out. Distribution. Then, pro, then, then sponsors, then kind of ticket sales, uh, because it, we, we haven't spent much. You did wrench, mention that uh, the, the Arena Games Live are competing with the experience you get on television. You mentioned Mark Cuban's done a great job with the Mavs. What's Baseball, it matters. Uh, I'm a big believer in that the scalable media, and this is just simple math. Let's do the math quickly. Okay. I'm an NBA team owner. It doesn't matter. About 18,000, right? We'll say? Yep. About 18,000. In an arena. Yep. In an arena times 41, right? Mm -hmm. What's the number? I don't know. Who's got a calculator? But 18,000 times 41. Matt, do you have a calculator? It, it, it is what uh, I went yeah. my, It'll take me forever to find out my, you know, the, the, the calculator. But that, it doesn't matter. We know it's a finite number. That's yep. it. Now, let me talk. 738 at whatever per cap, 18 bucks per cap, you might, on, on a good team. Okay. Again, a finite number. Now, let me look at the scalable media that I can deliver digitally to the 300 million basketball fans in China. I can charge for the last two minutes of a game. I can charge for highlights. I can charge for insider content to my favorite player, my favorite team. I can bring people in with user-created content. It, it's just so much bigger. Rev share on digital ads. Yeah, with sure, the sure, sure. I, I met with, I don't want to name the company, but a, a, a company that shows everything that happens around the soccer game. Hmm. They don't show the game. They show everything that happens around the game. And they're crushing it with millennials. Yeah. And there's real opportunity there. There's been some real investment from big-time companies, more on the way. Around the game, meaning? Happens in the stands, happens in the parking lot. Yeah. Whatever happens. Like, the culture of the game, because they don't have the money to be rights holders, hmm. because those are obviously are soaring. Yep. So they've decided to focus on 
everything else. Well, it's funny you say that. We had D. Smith on. It was one of my my favorite guests just because of how um, how well spoken he is. You know, his legal background and and he's dynamic and entertaining. And the anecdotes that he gave us were unapologetic, which was great. Uh, but NFL Inc.'s Ace Media looked yep. at Hard Knocks and said. Yeah, you know, we're talking probably six to eight percent of each episode is actually on field footage. Uh, so what we're looking at is an audience that's interested in our players, in their family, in their social lives, in their moving habits from city to city. And they were like, we we should, and within our rights, are should be controlling this. So I think that's again the content that's going in and around it. Um. Is that what you're? Is that what you're? Referencing? Yeah, and it's not happening in a vacuum either. The NBA players, who are the most visible, no helmets, no. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows the star-driven league. They too, in the recent round of collective bargaining, reclaimed their rights. Yep. That had historically, for a lump sum, thirty, forty million, whatever it was, had been licensed to the league. Say, you do it. You take our our likenesses. You take, you do, you have the institutional knowledge. You have the relationships with the video game companies, the sneaker companies. You do it. They have seen the value of the player content soar. I don't need Steph Curry in a Warriors jersey to be valuable. There's things we can do. There's things they can do. To add value, they, they've done an amazing job. I, you know, David Stern in the in the mid '80s turned that league around from negative perception to let's talk about Jordan Magic and Bird, and it was and before that it was a Magic and Bird league, um, and, and then we reached a point in time probably five years ago. We're just going to say, okay, well, what happens if LeBron faces some catastrophic event and is no longer in? Uh, prior to really Kevin Durant taking off over the subsequent events between shoe deal and trade and now title, you know, what's the league without the powerful, big, traditional three names? And you had Kobe, of course, in his retirement. Now they've been able to spin it under new leadership. And it feels like there's 30 big name guys per market. May, may not be LeBron level, but man, they've done a terrific job. I'll just job. tell you this, Paul. I don't remember. The numbers were just out, but... This is where, for all the people who were criticizing LeVar Ball, yeah. there's a strategy here. Mm. Did you see the numbers of the Summer League? It's unbelievable. So they, and they were up like 137%, something like that. They have gone to a year-round commanding attention, more than the NFL. Mm-hmm. They went from that award show, at first the draft. Okay, season over or in the finals, you have the draft. There's a whole lot of attention paid to that and a whole lot of shoulder programming and articles that come out. Then you had this award show. Now you've got Summer League. And people are tuning in. Like, sorry, Adam. I mean, I love Adam. I've known Adam for 25 years. I don't need to see Summer League. Right. <laughs> I'll wait to see Lonzo Ball in the season. But who cares? You know, that's Would you rather see NBA Summer League or Pro Lacrosse? <laughs> Anything that really counts, I would rather see. So I, I, I would, hey, let's tell everybody the one an game asshole. I brought some friends out to see him play. It was like, all right, you know, we'll meet up with Paul after the game. Yeah. yeah. And he goes hobbling off the field late. Well, we probably lost, you know? No, that's what you went to the hospital. Oh. Is there some contusion on your leg? Oh, that's you, and I, right. you, actually, you actually texted me because you you like you felt bad. You were like, yeah. I'm on my way to the hospital. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm getting injured too much these days. Well, old man. Yeah. <laughs> old happens. Old happens. But it's to the point of it's not just one guy. And David dealt with this. What are you going to do? I mean, can you finish the sentence? And think David in mid nine. What are you going to do when Michael Jordan retires? Mm-hmm. Okay, guess what? You may not know the name yet, but somebody fills the void. More than one person fills the void. Who saw Steph Curry coming? Who? Not Nike. No, they had a chance to match that deal with UA. <laughs> Although, I don't know, the sales haven't been exactly great. Right, right. But, yeah, surely they would have liked to have matched yeah. that deal. Um, 
Yeah, they didn't see it coming. Who sees Kevin Durant? Who sees James Harden? There's always somebody. There's somebody, and then you pit them up against up-and-comers or the establishment like LeBron is 31. What's 31 years old? 31 or 32, I, yeah. I, I, blink, I, I remember watching his first 18-year-old LeBron yep. in Sacramento in that mm-hmm. first game. They lost, but you were like, oh, this kid can play. Like, th- this was not unjustified hype. Yeah. He can play. And that's what David's always said. If you can play, you can play. Right. And that's what we're seeing. It's year-round... Russell Westbrook, I mean, is he going to partake in uh, Fashion Week in New York? Of course. Yeah, right? Yeah. He, he's, he'll be on the cover of Vogue. Yeah. These are, this is not just sports personalities anymore. They are crossover stars in all forms of media, fashion, news, you name it. Are we approaching a world where the athletes – have more leverage than the teams? Are we already there? Well, are we at the point where some shoe contracts pay more than the team contract? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where's the loyalty? I, perhaps, but there was a palpable difference way back when, when, when I was covering like, let's say labor talks in the NBA, there was a palpable difference when Michael Jordan showed up at the table. When Michael showed up, things were different. And let's not forget it was Michael Jordan, and only Michael had the gravitas to do this. Abe Poland in in a negotiating session, Abe Poland, Mm -hmm. elderly gentleman, but gentleman, longstanding owner, was complaining that he was having trouble turning a profit. And what did Michael Jordan say to him? Well, sell your team if you can't turn a profit. Abe went red-faced. He was livid. I mean, it had to be like held back. Like David, David Stern was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. But now, it's no accident that LeBron says, I hate these sleeve jerseys. What does Adam Silver do? Get rid of those sleeve jerseys. Yeah. These, these guys have a lot of leverage. And nowadays, if you show up a bargaining session with Chris Paul, Steph Curry, LeBron James... Yeah, these owners are going to listen. Hmm. They know where it's buttered. Yeah. It, you you said you talked about you're parsing out from the NBA's perspective um serving people highlights exclusively the final 2 minutes of a game, um content in and around a match for a soccer game. Will games shorten? Are is the actual product ever going to change as consumption for the viewer and the audience, the customer changes? Or are we just going to say, hey, the game needs to be 60 minutes, plus, minus? I've always said this, and let me know if you agree. Uh, And and it's a bit of hyperbole, but I've said this for 15 years, and we're creeping closer to some sort of reality. When I say if owners could figure out a way to have all the ancillary revenue tied to the games— without having to actually field a team and play the games, (laughs) they would do it. It's kind of e-sporty, kind of, sort of. Fantasy sports style. Fantasy, it's sort of uh, virtual games. Hmm. I mean, do you know that people bet on, like, virtual tennis matches? Yep. All right. I I kind of did it in a way when I was in in school. We would uh, simulate uh, Madden games. And uh, that was before they actually created owner and season mode. Yeah. And buddies of mine would just own it, would pretend we'd own a team, and we would simulate the game and then figure out who won. Anybody take the Jets? I don't think so. (laughs) 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 No. Yeah, but let VR, you can stage these games and people can watch from all over the globe. Yeah. On TV, on Twitch. You, you, and there's no athlete to have to deal with. Hmm. I, again, I said it's hyperbole, yeah. but it's not as far-fetched as it would sound. We're seeing a lot of traditional sports owners, Leon Craft, and all these folks getting into esports and investing there. And yep. It's effectively 
a, ten a, cent. A similar. It's a billion dollar industry that ten cent just said they're going to invest. They're going to push fifteen billion dollars into it. I mean, that that tells you something. Yeah. I don't think anybody knows where it's headed. They just know they all want to be in it in some capacity. Yeah. Well, listen, Scott, I could keep you here all day. I I, I want to ask you a number of questions uh, to end this. Okay. Um, and maybe we'll have a, a, a follow up because this is just this is uh, as as always a great uh, learning experience for me sitting down with you. What is the NFL's weak spot right now? We talked about the NBA dominating conversation. The NFL's weak spot right now, probably oversaturation. They thought hmm. they were invincible. It was appointment viewing on Sunday and Monday. Like, you know, that was Sunday is football day in America. And then Monday night was an event. But now I've got Thursday. I, I can afford not to watch. I've seen so many people like, and by the way, bad games, just bad matchups. That's not what you want for your product. You don't want nationally televised bad games or internationally streamed or televised bad games. But do you feel any compulsion to have to be in front of your TV set on Thursday night to watch the Jaguars play the Browns? Nope. No, I don't. And I think that that sort of creeps into the psyche of the fans saying, well, I missed that one. Uh, maybe I can miss this one too. Everything is built as the most important game of the year. Did they build their own grave with NFL Red Zone? Red Zone? Well, that that may be an enhancer In terms of, of pe- consumption. Well, these are people who probably maybe not watching the full games anyway. So if you do have an engaged audience for fantasy, give them what they want. Hmm. That that's okay. I don't think they're sitting there watching the whole game anyway. Maybe they're checking their phones for alerts on scores. Yep. So I don't know if they're cannibalizing their own product that way. But now they're trying to monetize on that, right? Oh, that, of course, yeah. What's sure. going to be their strategy? Because previously there were no ads being run against it, right? And now they're like, wow, we have more people watching this than the games, and now we have to figure out how to monetize. Now, sure, everybody's always looking to see how do we, when we have this audience, as John Skipper has said forever, just get the eyeballs. It's my job to monetize. Yep. So get the eyeballs. And so, they certainly do that. that I, I love that quote and to ask you as um pseudo commissioner of lacrosse and back to distribution um would you go for eyeballs and if so which platform and it doesn't have to be lacrosse name alternative niche sport i'm a believer in the value of of the default psyche of the sports fan when i don't care what the game is college football title this that Whatever it is, I think ESPN. And if I flick on my cable channel, 28 ESPN, Mm. if I flick it on and the game's not there, I have no idea where to go. I I don't know what Fox Sports Net, I don't know what NBC, I mean, maybe now because of the EPL, but that just shows the value of premier content. So you're tapping into validation of sports psyche via ESPN over let's come out of the gates with Amazon. I would have some component. If I was the commissioner of this this lacrosse league, I would like to see some component of my broadcast schedule, one game a week, I don't care, on a dominant platform. And then supplement with a non-traditional platform broadcaster where you by the way where you try fun things i want microphones on players yeah uh you get this like what the flag football league is is doing right now yeah i I, you gotta you gotta make it fun absolutely i haven't watched the 30 for 30 bit on why the xfl failed but apparently it's it's really wonderful and they talk about you know there are certain strategies out of the gates where now had they tweaked it here and there the biggest one was was not getting the talent Right, the, the game wasn't very good. And they right. underscore that by how much press they got around He Hate Me. And I, I was just going to say, to this day, I know He Hate Me. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, these were not dumb people. The, the McMahons no. and Dick uh, Ebersol and Brand aficionados. Yeah, these, these were not unintelligent people. Yeah. Uh, but at the core, and every commissioner will say this, for all of 
the bells and whistles, they will all say at the core of it all has to be the game. Mm -hmm. The game has to be the focus, the focal point of it all. Right. Or else what good is the rest of it? But I, how many years am I going back where David Stern and the union were bickering about we want to put cameras in the locker room at halftime? Yeah. One of the things the NFL PA is thinking of doing with its ace media, and I'm totally interested in this, I'd like to see players on the drive home after the game. Hmm. That's yeah. one of the things they're looking at. Wearables that, is big. They're still trying to figure out the governance around they'll, owning. They'll own the data. Sure. Yeah. And if they choose to, in some way, monetize the data with broadcast oh, Fantasy outlets, sports would be flipped on its fantasy head. Fantasy sports. Who, whose heart rate? Wouldn't it be great? I believe when I wrote the story, I think we were first with the story in the wearables. Speaking of breaking news, that's what we do. It was like, wouldn't you like to know the quarterback's heart rate? Super Bowl on the line. Okay, we're coming back from commercial. Boom. What what's Matt Ryan's heart rate right now? Yeah. And what is it what what was it for Tom Brady on the on the previous drive? Uh, I think h- huge numbers for skill players too is muscle depletion. Yep. And being able to make a prediction on a matchup if a guy's coming in off the bench and is fresh and and and, and mm-hmm. the corner that's covering him is down to 20 or 10% fuel in the tank. Yep. D Smith had a had a good quote we were talking about Adam Vinatieri and he said, "Man, Adam Vinatieri it was like kicking a field goal in the Super Bowl, riding a roller coaster, drinking a latte. Same. Heart rate flat line. level. Yeah, flat, flat line. <laughs> yeah. Do- doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Flat line. Yeah, but that would be some cool stuff yeah. that I'd like to see on my TV screen or but yeah. And imagine now if you're utilizing all of that data in we haven't even touched on this by the way you know i I think my kids campus is coming in 45 minutes but we'll get there (laughs) we haven't even touched on live in-game betting i mean sports betting is is going to be huge it's coming it will happen massive revenue stream for all these but what if i i'm armed with that data like wait a minute this quarterback's heart rate is through the roof and i can bet complete or incomplete do they score to and and the odds are being you know the algorithms are spinning with each play and resetting odds to win the game odds to kick a field goal odds to make a completion and, and talk about a way to shift consumption back to the entirety of a football game is if you have that live in game betting people are no longer just waiting for the highlights or checking them on Instagram you, you know Facebook, what I would do Twitter. they're now watching every play because I would money yeah I would even want go and watch a golf event. If I could sit myself on 18, I don't need to follow anybody around a course or right. whatever, but I would let those algorithms spin. I could sit there with my phone and I'd know whatever, I know, oh, give me a, Jason Day screwed up on wherever he, on the fifth hole yeah. because his odds to win the tournament just dropped. Yep. So maybe he shot six. But after every shot, they're recalibrating. Hmm. Is he going to hit the hole? Is he going to make this putt? Massive data. Even if it's massive data, if I don't care, five cents, whatever. Uh, but I would be engaged. Hmm. I could sit there and do that for hours. Yep. And that's what they're counting on. And we're talking about technology. And another question I have, we, we've talked a bit about Steve Ballmer, who's been on your podcast, again, The Business of Sports. Um. You mentioned Bill Gates, Mr. Bloomberg. I'm trying to call him Mr. Bloomberg because of my Hopkins affiliation. Mike, he likes Mike. <laughs> what's the what's the next big tech or billionaire that's going to get into sports that hasn't already yet? Jack Ma. There's my answer. Sure. Jack Ma. Yeah. Uh, I'm told, told, he peaked at the Buffalo Bills when... Terry Pagula bought them. Late to the game, peaked. That that would be my my guess. And besides, you know, there are also these hidden billiards, like who knew? Like nobody had heard of Jorge Mas right. before this Marlins process. And I'm not ready to say he's a billionaire. I actually had our guys look at it. Yep. And they couldn't definitively say on a back of napkin calculation what he had. But he's being termed a billionaire. And there are a lot of these folks like that. You mm-hmm. just don't know. Mm-hmm. But you wonder, and as we've seen, actually, let's just let's say he's a billionaire, close to, ain't enough. Yeah, <laughs> it's not enough. No. Yeah, 
So you build out a group around him. You build out a group, right? I like uh, the prospect of Joe Sai. Okay. You that. Co-founder yep. of yep. Alibaba. Yep. 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 Yale lacrosse guy. All right. So now you yeah, need to we, somehow get lure him in as a commissioner. I think that's probably too. It's just a no. But isn't isn't Bratches your guy? Isn't Soren Bratches now? He's working at F one. That's right. And and he's kind of flipping it. Like here, you have an immensely popular sport around the world that has no U.S. audience. Mm-hmm. So what we'd have to do just like flip lacrosse. How do you figure out now? How do you just kind of grassroots build the U.S. audience first? Yeah. But he, I know he's a friend. Olympics would be a, is a major play that is continuing to loom, especially with LA getting the yeah in, bid. in the in a time zone that would be friendly, because I don't think at least not now I don't know what kind of tape delay prime time coverage an up and coming sport would get or a promising sport yeah you know Summer Olympics you've got the pool you've got basketball and you've got Track and field and gymnastics. My favorite this past Olympics, yeah. handball. Yeah, handball's great. It's great. It was entertaining. Yeah. I think a USA Canada final. Um, put all the other games at midnight to 3 a.m. But you have a USA Canada lacrosse final. It's pretty action packed. Regardless, yeah. though, getting access to the rings is right. then gives you access to Olympic revenue coming from the USOC and IOC. And, and that then spurs not only more participation in the U.S. and North America, but adds to the 60 governed bodies that we have now at the international level. But isn't everybody, I mean, this one here, isn't everybody playing lacrosse now? Like that's, that's what all the kids are doing? I suppose, yeah. We're, I, mean, we're, I, we're I see it's anecdotal, to, but I, I yeah. see kids of friends, they're all playing lacrosse. Well, our, our youth participatory numbers continue to grow year over year. I think a statistic that we need to keep a tighter eye on is retention. I was going to say, at what point do they break away to soccer, basketball, baseball? And that comes down partially to resources and also coaching. And that's where when you have a smaller constituency, like a million people playing lacrosse, you got to get as many quality coaches out that are working with the kids that are pulling the stick off the shelf for the first time. It's super technical. I know you're in the hockey world with your son, um, but at least there are, more, there, are more, <laughs> there are more visuals out there, and, and we learn through visual assessment. In lacrosse, there are fewer visuals than that being on our screens and games on television. So you pick up a stick with this netting and a pocket, and some of them strung obscurely from the shelf, and you can't throw the ball. You set it down. That's it. Yeah. So you got to have a good coach. Yeah, but like with ice hockey, there's that nobody's good at it from the start. Like the but first imagine, thing I, but imagine having your stick and the puck just lip off of it every time. At least there's like the, the hey, as I opposed to falling on your rump, like uh, you can't even stand that's up. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, the first thing I did, and I'm I was very <laughs> cognizant of that. The first thing I did with my son when I took him on the ice that very first time, I stepped on the ice first and intentionally went down to show him it's okay. Well, that's a good parent. I was, well, good on, I, I was good on that day. The other thing, too, is, is if I am on the stage as an Ovechkin or a Crosby, I think young lacrosse kids are more willing to fall for the first time <laughs> with the end game of potentially making hundreds of millions of dollars of on-ice contracts. I've and, said, you guys, lacrosse should have some sort of massive buy-in from Wall Street. There should be charity yeah, games. Right. That, that uh, Everybody from Princeton get together – Again, so you're going to play Yale, you're going to play Cornell, you're going to play Hopkins, you're going to play my alma mater, Syracuse. So, of course, you know, there's the victor. But <laughs> Gary and Paul come back, Tommy Marichek there comes back. Oh, man. See? I, that was pretty good recall, right? You lied about the Mark Cuban impersonation. There <laughs> no, I, is interest. I, I, well, when, if you were at Syracuse when Gary <laughs> yeah, and Paul were right. playing, again, drawn to stars. Mm-hmm. Like for people who don't know Gary Gate, Go Google air gate. Right. When you jump over from behind the net and stuff it in, like he was more than just a lacrosse player. Yep. He was an iconic athlete. Yeah. He and, had to deal and, with uh, Coke and Yeah, and and people and wanted Toyota to see it. And, right. So now he coaches the women's teams at Syracuse. Yep. But a mighty good he, job. Yeah, he was, he was something else. So who's, who's like now? I don't know the something else. Who's the, who's the somebody else now? Who's that guy? Well, you know, I'm trying to be. Oh. 
uh, as we said, in, in, in somewhat of a... Let's uh, end the podcast before that. <laughs> before, before you strain a hamstring pushing away from the table. <laughs> All right, brother. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. It was, it, great. It, it was fun. Yeah, fun to do. Now I'm gonna hopefully join the business of sports on your. Pod. We will have you, we will have you on. I promise you. And there will be links to that in our show notes for all of our listeners. I encourage you to get on there. He's much smarter than me and knows sports business far far better than I. But enjoy the conversation. Thank you. If you enjoyed Scott and my conversation be sure to let us know. And you can do that by contacting me on social media across all platforms. It's at Paul Rabel, one word. Be the first to listen to future episodes as well as catch up on previous episodes, including my one-on-one conversation with legendary New England Patriots dynasty head coach Bill Belichick, who's in the middle of summer training camp right now, world-class tennis star and entrepreneur Venus Williams, who had a great run in the Wimbledon, and NBA star Jeremy Lin, just to name a few. Also, Since our How We Built This episode aired last week, we've received a ton of great suggestions on the style of the show, runtime, and guest introductions. We made some significant headway on the latter, so stay tuned for exciting announcements. You can find all these episodes and more on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your pods. There's a shortcut to our show notes, which are extensive. Visit suitinguppodcast.com. Shout out to our show's sponsor today, Barbasol. Be sure to support them the way you've so graciously supported this show. And I look forward to talking to you all next week.